comes the rain, with my anger comes a tide of emotion, killing joy, cutting steel across your eyes. Are you dead? Hi, this is Brendan Davis from Bedrock Games and the Bedrock Blog, and I'm here with Jeremy Bai for another episode of the Righteous Blood Podcast. And today we're going to be talking about the movie Death Duel, and we're going to be talking about how it relates to our game uh, Righteous Blood Ruthless Blades, which um, this is one of the movies that was a heavy source of inspiration. Um, and we want to get into some of the mechanics of the game and uh, and, you know, and for those who don't know, the game, the Righteous Blood Ruthless Blades is coming out in December. I think it's what December eighth and December tenth. Is that the? Those are the two release dates, depending on which side of the pond you're on. And yeah. uh, and so yeah, people should you know go to the Osprey page. They can check it out. Uh, it looks really wonderful, and I'm you know we're really getting excited that it's coming out. And we just wanted to kind of go over some of the movies that inspired it and how those relate to the mechanics. So before we get there, though. I, I don't know Jeremy's uh, experience with this movie, so uh, I wanted to know, you know, what what is your experience and your 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 view on this film? Well, I think at this point I did rewatch it um, before doing this podcast. In fact, I literally just finished watching it probably about thirty minutes ago, and I think this is the third time I've seen it. I, I forget. Number one, it's a beautiful movie. Just just visually, it's really beautiful visually. Story is very cool. Characters are great. Uh, choreography is pretty good. I really, really like it. It's it encapsulates our game. I'd say quite a bit. Um, and one really cool. This is a very, very minor thing. But one thing that I thought was so cool because I wasn't expecting it is that there are cameos from characters in other uh, Gulo-inspired uh, Shaw Brothers movies. In the middle, there's a. Yeah. Uh, a cameo from T. Lung reprising his character from Magic Blade that obviously takes place after Magic Place, uh, sorry, Magic Blade took place. And then there's also Lolia's character, the fisherman character from Killer Clans, and they both show up at certain points in the middle. And I just, I thought that was so cool. And for anybody out there who doesn't know about that connection or who hasn't seen these movies, the watching order, if you want to watch it in the correct order, would obviously be watch Magic Blade then Killer Clans, then Death Duel, and you'll be able to see all of those characters kind of come and go. Yeah. Uh, in any case, that's not particularly important to the movie as a whole. Overall, I just would say it's it's great, and the story is just, it's, it's kind of dark, which again yeah. matches our game to a large extent, and it's definitely probably would be in my top ten, although I keep yeah. saying I'm going to rank my, the movies one day. I haven't done it, but if I do, probably this one will get into my top ten. This is definitely in my top ten. It's also in like my top Choi Yuen movies, like this, Intimate Confessions of a Chinese Courtesan, and like maybe Magic Blade or something. You know, there's always a few that are vying for those top positions, but but this one is the one where I really realized just how you know magnificent Choi Yuen was, and it, it it also it's like you said, it's so dark. Like visually, it's dark, and it gets at so many of the themes that that, that we were striving to emulate. Uh, and I don't know, I I just love the, this is the kind of movie that just is driven by this powerful emotion towards the end that just really works for me. And I feel like Wuxia is satisfying to me when I get that emotional closure at the end of the film. And this, this delivers it and it delivers it with style. And, and also it's like a, the structure of the movie is really, it's, 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 uh, it's, oddly simple do you know what i mean it just is kind of all pointing towards this looming duel and it's about this character who's trying to escape from the martial world escape who he is and he gets dragged back in and it's like the more he tries to escape the more the the more damage he does and the more tragedy that happens and then he he's just forced to in this wonderful scene just you know, put on all of his regalia for the sect that he belongs to and, you know, embrace his identity and then go and, you know, face, uh, you know, face off with, um, the, uh, the, the, the swordsman, uh, Yan Shisan. Um, and also the other thing that's good about this one is the actor who plays the third master in it is, um, the guy who directs another version of this movie decades later, 
and they both pair really well together. Um, and we'll probably handle that movie separately. Um, so yeah, I, I, you know, I, I think this is a, is a great movie on its own. And, and I think the, uh, the, there were a few key areas of inspiration. I guess we can get to the one that you pointed out to me, which was, I obviously took the idea of bone physician from this movie and bone physician is a character in the book. Who's kind of a, kind of a creepy, maybe possibly evil physician, um, who, you know, uh, you know, he, he, who, I don't want to spoil all the details, but I think he's a really fun, eccentric character. And there's a physician in this movie. I think there's act, there's technically, I think what I, my brain kind of did was it took the, the two physicians from this film and kind of cobbled them together. Do you know what I mean? And, and that's where I, that's sort of what created bone physician in my head. Yeah, that, that one, I didn't know about that going into watching this again. And so when I saw that character, I was just like, wow, this really reminds me <laughs> a lot of both positions. So it turns out my guess was right. Yeah. And one thing I, I wanted to point out about it is that unlike some of the other movies that we've talked about in the podcast, I feel like this one is not one that you could really very easily turn into any sort of like adventure or campaign. You know, like for instance, uh, Bride with White Hair 2 was one that you could just, you could take the movie and make a campaign about it or an adventure at least this one i feel like not so much but the, but in terms of the themes and just little teeny elements here and there it definitely uh it covers everything that we were going for in the in the game so it's and one of the things um so going on to unless there was something more you wanted to say about well, bone physics. well something i want to say about what you just said is that um i think this kind of plot it's not it's obviously not one you can plan in advance unless you have a particular type of like our game is not one that does that sort of thing where it it, it uh you know has tools for making certain sort of stories definitely happen um it's more open-ended and more freeform uh but it's the kind of adventure where if a savvy GM can see it coming in the game itself and and allow it to happen if that's where the... Do you know what I mean? So if a duel like this arises, you could have a campaign like this, but it's not necessarily... It's got to kind of happen organically because obviously the, the protagonist in this movie would be a player character. And unless you're railroading them, you just can't get to that final duel without... Do you know what I mean? It has to, yeah. it has to happen on its own. And so much of this movie it revolves around either tragic or dark or at least just, you know, I don't know what the right word is, but bad stuff happening to the main character. Yeah. And although that stuff makes for great drama in movies and books, when it's happening to a player character, I don't think that's particularly fun. I, I know from firsthand experience, because I was in a game once with a good friend of mine who was a GM, and this was back in the days when Game of Thrones was probably only in mm. maybe season two or three or something, I, I feel like. And so he was wanting to recreate the sort of, you know, extremely dramatic, like, tragic stuff that happens there. And so he had this idea for this scene that he wanted to happen. And it was it was happening to my character. And it was just really kind of a humiliating and, like, just igno... It was really hu humiliating defeat, essentially. Mm. And despite the fact that I should have been able to escape that situation he basically made it so that I, it was impossible for me to escape and this really horrible humiliating thing happened to me and i, I wasn't like crying or something about it but it just wasn't fun and so yeah. if you were going to try to recreate this movie on a character and then like every turn that they everything they did and every turn resulted in them being kicked to the, to the yeah. dirt it probably wouldn't be very fun well i think the way that you handle that stuff is obviously you don't make it impossible like I think the problem that that GM ran into is they were they were saying this has to happen the way that I've envisioned it because I have this grand, tragic yeah. thing. A much better way is number one, allow it to unfold organically. Maybe in a campaign you cross somebody who decides I'm going to get revenge on you, and then once that ball gets rolling, the GM has to be very fair and even handed in how they deal with that. And so I think I think having a good sense of fairness and also players who you know trust you so that you're not um you know you're not putting them in a situation where it's like well obviously anything i do is bound to failure if you're you know so i i think i think a lighter hand is the way to handle that stuff and i think also not starting with the idea of i want this scene to happen but more yeah, exactly. working through the npcs like my npc really wants to get revenge how is he going to do that um 
you know, that sort of thing. But also there is one mechanism in our game that can kind of kind of touch on this stuff, which is the destiny paths. Um, and again, it's a much it's 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 a lighter it's a it's a lighter idea and it's and it's a sort of randomized thing. But the notion is the player can select from a number of different tables and those tables have different results on them. And whatever is rolled randomly, secretly, that is the player character's destiny. Uh, it's an optional rule. It's not something you use in every game. But you could sort of see the Derek Yee character being somebody who has a particular destiny path. And what a destiny path would do is it wouldn't it wouldn't force all of this stuff to happen. But it would mean that, that whatever that person's destiny is, it functions a bit like gravity. So say his destiny is to lead this sect that he's trying to escape from. Anytime he's in a situation where he's resisting his destiny, there might be a small penalty. And anytime he's leaning into his destiny, there's a bonus. But the thing is, the character doesn't necessarily know what their destiny is. So, uh, and and obviously, we, we do, because of the nature of the destiny path thing, we do mention in the book that it is really more for like experienced GMs because it's a little hard to to manage that sort of thing if you're not accustomed to it. So... Yeah, I would say it's definitely for experienced GMs and probably experienced players as well. Mm. One thing that I've um, noticed, I feel like I have more experience with new players. I, I don't know why, just over the years I've, I've played with a lot of new players. And I, maybe you can chime in with your opinion, but I feel like players who have not played a lot of role-playing games, when they play the first few times and the first few characters, like they are extremely invested in that character being like the ultimate character and their ultimate character. And I feel like as players get more experience and they kind of get those ones out of the way, then they're more interested in kind of exploring new ideas and seeing where destiny takes them, yeah. for lack of a better term. So for yeah. experienced players and GMs, that destiny thing I think would be really cool. And I really like the idea also of the player being able to, the player not really knowing what their destiny is and finding it. But yeah. again, you know, that takes, is going to take a lot of effort on the part of the GM. And what's cool about it is the destiny paths. What I like, and I use something similar. I call, I had like the faded flaw in Ogregate. It was a very similar concept, but I, we kind of refined it here and it's, it's, I think it works better, but the, the, the cool thing about it is then it can also tie into stuff like fortune telling. So it can make, any fortune telling skill roles can actually have an effect in the world. I mean, it's stuff like, you know, that, that is meaningful. So I, I like how those things all kind of work together. Um, but yeah, I, I'm with you. I think that new players, when I was a new player, I mean, all of my first characters magically had all 17s and 18s for <laughs> attributes in my D and D games when I first played. And, you know, anybody who's played D and D knows that's, pretty hard to do but you know somehow i managed to pull it off with my first three characters and the gm looked the other way i think um <laughs> but uh but yeah i think everybody wants to be whatever the ultimate god character is like at the time when when i was really getting into D, &D i think uh you know i started in 85 so i started a little before this but by the time everything was in full swing um dritz Stewart was like a big character and that was the one that you know you Everybody right. seemed to be wielding two blades, and, yeah. and 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 everybody was kind of a badass. I think that's always the thing, and 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 also this in this genre, there's nothing wrong with wanting to play a character who is a badass. That's kind of the that's kind, you know it's that kind of genre. It's just like it's like a it's like a western genre or a spy genre where yeah everybody kind of wants to be James Bond or wants to be um, the man with no name or John Wick or this kind of character. And I think that's fine. Um, but you can be that character and also have an interesting destiny, too. Um, and uh, and also the other thing about our game is it is, to get into a topic that you brought up, which I thought was an interesting observation about this movie, um, you don't necessarily know that if you're, if you're the Derek Yee character or not in our game. You know what I mean? So, yes, that character can exist, but you don't... You, you, it, this is a it's intended to be a somewhat lethal game I and mean, we wanted that tension that i think this this movie is all built around a duel that everybody knows is going to happen you don't know who's the better swordsman and and on a micro level every fight is kind of like that like you were saying like every you, you know some people go in and they're really cocky and they just get killed in the first two seconds and so our game embraces that and 
and that's why we always wanted we always wanted we always kind of thought of duels like this in the back of our mind when we were constructing the combat mechanics and constructing how combat works and um so i think i think that that's another interesting element of the game that connects to this movie yeah, I kind of went back and forth as we were going through the design process and testing and stuff about my thoughts on that. So I think me and you even had multiple conversations where yeah. I was like, well, how is the GM supposed to create an encounter when he doesn't know how, you know, blah, blah, blah. And we do have some advice in the book yeah. for how GMs can kind of try to set up balanced encounters. But in the end, I think this way is great. I mean, in this movie, again, like you mentioned, it's a perfect example, not just of the final duel, but throughout the story, there are people running into the main character, and he is, you know, he is either the top swordsman or the number two swordsman. Is yeah. basically the premise. The the, the two characters, the and and thirteenth, or sorry, third young master, they're both top swordsmen, and the wants to find out if he is better, and so they're going to have this duel. So basically, nobody really knows who's better. But yeah. the point is, they're both like ultimate swordsmen, and yet many many people come and pick a fight with, you know, third young master and then just get beaten up or killed instantly. And so in our game, um, we do have a system by which you can sort of assess an opponent. Yeah. We have a thing called Killing Aura, and the Killing Aura essentially correlates to the person's level. Uh, so when you assess somebody's Killing Aura, the GM is supposed to do it in a little bit of a sort of artistic fashion. They don't just say, oh, he's level three. He'll, you know, he's, you know, yeah. he'll say, like, his Killing Aura is far higher than yours or something like that. So yeah. you could at least get an idea, but... There are ways to mask that aura. Um, High-level characters can automatically mask it after a certain point, and then there are abilities that let that let you do that even before you're at a high level. So really, you have it's very difficult to tell yeah. what just looking at somebody if they're necessarily better than you or whatever. And so that I think carried over very well, and the and the the players should kind of have that question in the back of their mind all the time is it, yeah. when they're facing off with somebody and they're going to fight them and they assess them, and it's not a clear read. Is it somebody that doesn't know martial arts? Is it a, some top master that's hiding his ability? Is it, you know, who knows? Uh, yeah. That that tension definitely carries through. I, I, at least in, in my games and playtesting, it was definitely a success, I think, the way that it played out. Yeah, and the other thing, too, is this is the sort of thing we were talking about, how, like, not... Like, no game can emulate every movie and every aspect of every movie, and so... You know, if we're trying to emulate a movie like Killer Clans, where I feel like Killing Aura was more present somehow. Do you know what I mean? Uh, you know, you're going to want Killing Aura. But one thing that the GM can always do is they can always just take Killing Aura out if they want to if they want to intensify that tension. Um, you know, you can do that with a, a lot of different mechanics. I think I think that's an important probably something we should have addressed more in the game. But we didn't have space. We, we we ran into space issues in terms of game content. So this might be a blog entry, but uh, but I but I I really feel we should have emphasized, you know, th- these kinds of games. The GM is not just the GM. The GM should look at themselves as a game designer too, and they should be willing to 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 take apart a game to to rework it. This is a hobby, and so like any hobby, you know you know you're just as much of a mechanic as the people who make the game and so i think that uh you know this would be an area where if somebody is is playing righteous blood ruthless blades and they specifically want to emulate a specific movie and they're like well this mechanic doesn't quite line up take that mechanic out or add one in that will will line up um you know i i I freely do that in my own game so i i you know I, i think that uh uh that's an important point but that said i think that the killing aura is still i think we struck our good balance because the killing aura is opaque enough that you still maintain that tension um now the other thing i wanted to get into was um the 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 way well to give some backstory here the this movie is based on a book called the sword sword of the third young master written by gulong and it's a really good book and one of the things in the intro to the book that Gulong says is that he tried to treat every character like a coin with two sides. And he's kind of talking about how like he didn't want to just make them like all hateful or all characters that you liked. He wanted to have, you know, that extra level of depth. But there's something admirable, but something a little repugnant about them. And when we were 
working on the NPCs, which were really central to the game, uh, that was something that I kept in mind a lot. I was like very conscious of that concept. And so even though it's not as present in the movie itself, it, it's, uh, it's still something that when I see this movie, I think about in terms of, you know, where I was trying to go with, 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 uh, with the characters, uh, in the, in the game. Um, so yeah, I don't know if you had any thoughts on that or, uh, yeah, well, I, I mean, um, I pretty much am on board with you on this one, I think. Um, but, uh, but yeah, so, I mean, and again, I, I, I you know, just so people understand, there's, I think we have what, like 50 characters in the rule book. Is that the total uh some yeah about that yeah yeah so i mean so it really i felt i i really did feel like we were writing sort of the third young master in a, in a way because it's like we were like gulong has an insane number of characters and for him to kind of take each character and and i think if i remember it's almost like every chapter he re, he introduces a character and I, I could be wrong about the structure but i feel like it's like you get a character introduced and the next chapter you kind of see that other side of the coin about the character and if it's not the next chapter it's like the next beat in the chapter but um, yeah one thing i did when i was, was what the way we went about it um was we you and i kind of essentially would create characters in like short bursts i think like we would yeah. aim for four a week or five or forget what it was and so, in the end, I think we each roughly came up with half of the characters, each roughly speaking. Yeah, we and, we 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 specifically assigned ourselves each half of the. Yeah, and then we the each kind of like gave feedback and went back and forth, and then in the editing process as well, we kind of tweaked things here. So we 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 both had a hand yeah. in pretty much everything. But yeah. in terms of the foundation, you made about half, I made about half, and what I did at a certain point was that I started going through to see which of these characters were like like obviously villainous or bad because mm -hmm. we have a, we have quite a few and then i did try to put in a few that were just good characters and you yeah. have some as well that are good but even those good characters have either vices they have some vice yeah. or they might have some dark backstory like there's one character who's the um leader of we we essentially have a uh, a place where people can retire to it's called the the halls of tranquility and they it's it's a, a location where um, basically people can essentially be invincible as long as they remain in that location, mm -hmm. but they have to like take these vows and promise to be good and stuff and all this. And as, as the idea is that anybody can go there, good or bad, mm -hmm. they can retire from the Jiang Hu and just focus on, you know, whatever spiritual aspects and not fighting and killing. And then the leader of that organization is a former, like, really bad guy yeah, I think, yeah. I'm pretty sure you I think you created him maybe I did I forget I think you may I don't remember but I, I I do remember having a hand in that character with he has this backstory with his wife and I think I, I uh, like a, a lot of the things that are obvious Brendan things or if you see like romantic threads those are often <laughs> my hand um, but I, I and I do want to emphasize to just re, you know what, what Deathblade said is that or what Jeremy said is that um, we, we both did equal work on these characters i think very uh very consciously uh we were doing that and yeah. when i said that i um that i had the two coins in mind when i was working on the characters what i meant was is when i was going through them like when you were going through them that's what i was looking for do you know what i mean like that two yeah. that two sides of the coin um yeah. and so we i think we pulled that off with most of them and i think that leads to some pretty good character depth to where we don't have I mean, just like Gulo and a lot of his stories, or most of his stories, I guess you could say, he doesn't have uh, so many black and white characters. His characters are all sh different shades yeah. of gray in one way or another. Yeah, and they're not like, when we say depth, it's not like depth in like a, um, I don't know what you would say, like a modern drama type movie depth. It's more like, a, it's more like, like, the, like how Wuxia handles it, which is like, characters have like surprising traits or character. Like, I guess a good example of that would be... Um, What's his name from Hero Shed No Tears? The one who loves to dance. Was it Mung? Uh, that was, yeah, that was uh, Zhu Mung. Yeah. So, yeah, so Zhu Mung, you know, he, he's this real manly man, but he's like extremely into dance and his face lights up in, in the movie version at least when he's dancing when uh, Ku Fung is playing him he you know his face lights up and it's just this real weird contrast to his otherwise like you know really and, and he's got this this lion-like physique too so it's just kind of 
it just makes it even more interesting. Um, so, you know, so that's the kind of depth I think we were layering onto these characters. Um, and, and also I think we were, uh, I think this is a, again, another reason why this movie is, and the, the two sides of the coin thing, um, and a scene that we're about to talk about, uh, uh, you know, is relevant to the game is, is our game has, it's open to anti-heroes and reluctant heroes. Do you know what I mean? We have, we have a lot of those kinds of characters in there to populate the world. And there's a scene in this movie, which it just, always just stands out of my mind where he goes to a tavern and he keep, he, he I think he, like he's talking to a scholar and you know, he, and it's, and it's a very crucial moment in the hero's life. And he, he's at, he's kind of looking for meaning and he asks like, you know, if you could do anything in the world, what would you do? And the scholar's like, oh my God, I've, I waste my whole life studying and studying. And I just wish I had gone out. I forget what it was, but he like wanted to go out and like, you know, just have fun basically or do other things. And then there's a woman and he's like, well, what would you do? And the, and the father woman's like, don't even say it. Like she's got a tablet over there that says she's a chaste woman and she wouldn't do anything except like, you know, be a chaste woman. And she's like, no, I'd go sleep with a man. Cause it's so fabulous. <laughs> and it's just the, the way that these characters just break loose from the constraints that society has put on them to me. Number one, that's a very gulong type move, but, but number two, it, I don't know. It gets at the kind like those. Th- that's sort of the um, that's sort of the world that our Jiang Hu is operating in. It's a little bit more unorthodox. It's not as you know strictly Confucian in that way. There's like a there's a there's 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 just that streak running through it. Um, and so I think yeah. that theme is a big theme I took from this movie that I wanted to carry into the game. Um, but uh, but also it's just it's just a funny scene. Like if people have it's just it's one of those scenes that just pops when you watch it because it's so amusing the way it's done. And that's also the scene where the cameos show up because then yeah. the woman gets attacked and there's you know uh, uh, I think uh, I forget if it's T Long or Lo Lea who show up first, but you know they, I think they both show up at that scene. I was just <clears throat> rewatching. I actually rewatched it in two back two sections, and I watched the last about third just now and I had passed that part and then I went back to rewind it and I'm, if, I'm, if I remember correctly I think uh, T-Long comes first and okay. Lolia and the, I'm pretty sure if I remember correctly Lolia says the same he has the same catchphrase as from Killer Clans he says if you want to kill him you have to kill me first or whoever wants to kill him has yep. to kill me first or something and then he even wipes the blood on his face as well just like from Killer Clans um, that was I, I just I would really love that part I love that guy that character too uh, and, spoilers he dies in killer clans but he was just a really cool character and also he's a, he's an example of how there really shouldn't be limits on genres like he's essentially luca brazi from the godfather like i mean there's just it's it's i i, I don't know that for a fact but like i'm like 99 percent sure that that's luca that's his version of luca brazi and and luca brazi's an awesome character and that character has that same I don't know what you would call it. Like this, there's like an esoteric power to him because he's just the, he's operating on a different level than everybody else, and everybody's kind of afraid of him. And and I, I and so that scene, when, you know, it's it's a little bit more comical because it's like they condense his whole character story into like that one cameo. So you get everything yeah. from the you must go through through me before you get to him, and then the blood the blood stain on the face. Um, you know, I was wondering. You know, my, I have a theory because uh, if, I, if I remember the dates correctly, I'm pretty sure uh, Killer Clans came out the year before Death Duel. So I'm just wondering if somehow Lolia's character in Killer Clans got some buzz or something, uh, or a lot of people liked it, and so they they decided to throw it into a cameo the next year just because people liked it so much. Maybe, maybe that maybe they were like, hey, we'll put in whoever would like the best. Uh, yeah, you know, I'd have to, I'd have to read. I don't think those cameos are in the book, but I'd have to check to be sure. It's been a while I, I since I read. Check it. On I checked just cursorily on Baidu. I pulled up the Baidu wiki on. Mm. Um, I pulled up the Baidu wiki on of sort of the third. Sorry. The, the sort of the third young master and I just did a search in uh, like a global search mm. and I didn't see the name of the character pop up like it has a list of characters and he's not in there and I also looked up his character entry on the wiki as well and it mm. didn't it just specifically said he was in 
Horizon. I think it's Horizon Bright Moon Saber, or I forget. Butterfly that's the that's the, te- the te- yeah Butterfly Meteor is the um, yeah. one with um. So I don't. I think that was probably just a movie version. And I, I by the way, I never mentioned this, but um, the, Lolia and Tilong are I think my two favorite actors in all of yeah. the old school movies. Uh, I just there's I love both of them, and so to see them both in, in reprising their roles here just really tickled me. It was really yeah. really. L- Lolier is the best at playing villains, in my opinion, and T. Lung is the best at playing, like, heroes, but heroes that have kind of, like, a dark side to them. Do you know what I mean? Like, yeah, um, for sure. And so... so speaking of which, I, I was going to pop this in earlier. I did, didn't have a chance. Just, you were talking about the um, the killing auras and different things like that, and uh, and I just, I recently was watching uh, Sentimental, or... Uh, what's it called? Return of the Sentimental Swordsman, I think. It's basically Sentimental Swordsman 2 with T. Lung. He reprises the role of uh, um, Lee Tanhua or little, basically Little Lee's Flying Dagger. And that movie has a really, um, I think, a, a lot more uh, emphasis on the aura and the ratings of the fighters. So it probably would be good for us to talk about that one. We don't mention it in the... Uh, in the the book and incidentally i yet again i forgot to mention this at the beginning uh if you go to my website which is jeremyby.com i have a section for righteous blood ruthless blades it has links to all of our podcasts it has some blog articles that i've written and it has also links to all of the movies that we mentioned in the book as well as uh if you scroll down on that recommendations page i also have other personal recommendations from me that are not in the book um so yeah i forgot to mention that That, before now what's what was the name of that story that that was uh, that movie was based on again the, the, the sentimental swordsman. It's, yeah. it's translated different ways, but the way I read it when I read the translation was sentimental swordsman ruthless ruthless swords. Mm. In Chinese, it's duoqing jian ke wuqing jian, which duoqing you can translate it different ways, but sentimental works like many. The the character um, Qing is kind of it's it's hard to translate into Chinese into English in the right way to make a play on words because it can be translated different ways. So in Chinese, duo qing jian ke. Jian ke means swordsman, which is kind of weird because he doesn't actually use a sword. But in any case, duo qing means, duo means many or multiple, and qing means, you know, emotions or feelings. So so it's somebody who has is full of feeling, which that character obviously is. That's why he drinks so much. And then wu qing jian. Wu means without, and qing means... You, same thing, emotions or feelings. So it's in English they say sentimental swords and ruthless sword. The Wu Qing could be could be ruthless or it could be um, you know merciless or it could be without emotion. It could be heartless or something like yeah. that. So in any case, yeah, that's the title of that one. Yeah, because I remember you. Rec- I think you told me that was one of your either your favorite or one of your favorite Gulong stories uh, way back before we were working on this even. Yeah, and yeah, uh, that's it's yeah. been years since I read it. Um, so I don't know what my reaction would be. Yeah. Now that I'm a lot older, <laughs> but um, it definitely was one of my favorite one favorite movies, and I I liked his character a lot. Um, I just quoted the book I think in one of my recent blog articles about drinking and the and the drinking aspect of Righteous Blood Ruthless Blades. A lot of it, at least for me, uh, is inspired by that story. Although you know, Gulong obviously has drinkers in pretty much all of his stories, just about. But it's specifically in um in uh in uh, Sentimental Swords and Ruthless Swords, the little Lee character. Um, he's drinking all the time, and I, I, I think he's he for me was a big inspiration to the entire drinking system in general because he, the the I quoted this part in the blog article on drinking, but basically he's the kind of guy who he'll basically just be drinking constantly nonstop, and then mm-hmm. he'll kind of be described as being in a drunken stupor or something, and then all of a sudden it's time for a fight scene, and he, he looks like he hasn't been drinking at all, so it's almost like the drinking doesn't really affect him. Okay. I think the quote um, in the blog article from there is it says something like, a lot, most people can get drunk um, easily, but people who drink all the time they, and then want to get drunk later will have to work really hard to do it or <laughs> something along those lines. So yeah, I guess that's what Gulong thought of drinking. Yeah, I guess, yeah, our our, our game definitely has an emphasis on that drinking. And I, I remember uh, you had recommended a translation of that to me and I read it. And I mean, I again, it's I, I, don't, I don't know how you would react to it today, but I, I, I thought it was a very enjoyable read. Uh, it is a longer Gulong book, was my impression, so I felt like it was more work than, say, like, uh, Heroes Shed No Tears or something that's a little bit, you know, you know, more digestible inside a few days or something. Um, 
the one thing I would say is if you read a book like that, especially one that's a little longer, definitely take notes of the character names because that will help you a lot when you get to like page 400 and they mention a character who you've forgotten about. And yeah. especially if they switch up the spelling of the character name or <laughs> anything like that, like you really like, especially with the fan translations, you really want to take notes if you're going to do the readings. Um, yeah. That's that's the thing I remember. I, I, I showed you my um, bride with white hair uh, <laughs> you notes know, that I that I you know that I, yeah. I used to always do that when I would uh, read these books. Not to uh, mention the fact that. In English, a lot of those names just blend together. I mean, mm. they're, in Chinese, it tends to make a lot more sense because you there's a visual element to it that mm -hmm. pops out. And especially with Usha um, characters, the, the names of these characters a lot of times are not particularly realistic. Mm -hmm. um, it's a struggle for a lot of translators, I, too. Uh, and, and in my opinion, it most of the time, it's better to not translate the names because they're, they're not... Like, it's like it's like names in English um, that are also common nouns. Like they do mean those things. Like for example, the name Jet or Kitty mm -hmm. or Cherry or Stone or something. Like those are all like actual nouns. And yes, when you hear somebody, when some, you know somebody who has that name, you you can, for instance, maybe think of the actual noun. But it turns into a name, not that thing. And yeah. So translating it is, in my opinion, most of the time not preferable. And so okay. there's certain translations out there, even official ones. Where I think people who are not that familiar with Usha see them and oh, that's such a weird, interesting name. I have to translate it so that mm -hmm. it comes across, and then it just kind of I don't know doesn't doesn't really carry the same feeling as it does in okay. Chinese. But anyway, uh, I actually now forgot why I went on that rant. Whenever I that's okay. Names, that's names okay. I start ranting about that kind of kind of thing. Oh, we were talking about the fan translations. I just was going to say that. In English, those names don't pop as much on the page, so it's a lot easier to lose track of who's who. I remember yeah. when I was reading um, uh, Romance of the Three Kingdoms, it was just like crazy because there's so many people with the same surname and then like a very small variation on the yeah. on the given name. You're like, who are all these people? It's kind of hard to tell. Yeah, that can that can get that that that's I think that's anytime you're reading something that's from a language that's not your own and you're dealing with names that you're not accustomed to. I think that's always a, uh, that's always a challenge. Um, and, and what makes it doubly challenging, I think is the translations. Like there's not like a consistent, this is always the way it's done. So sometimes you'll read a book and the name will be like the person's name is fragrance or flower or something. And then in another version, it'll be like the, whatever the sound of the word is. Yeah. And so the, yeah. and that can actually make it hard to find the story that you're, you know what I mean? Like find references to the story and things like that. Yeah. If you're trying to do research. Um, so there's, there's all kinds of challenges there. If you're going through translation, which is what I'm always doing. So, uh, you so there know. was two other things I wanted to mention before we ran out of time. And, um, one of them, this is like kind of something that I feel is sort of important, but these important things always come up 45 minutes into these podcasts. So it's yeah. like one of these days, somebody's going to complain about something. I'm going to say, well, just go listen to our 10 hours of yeah. podcast and then you'll find an answer to the question somewhere. But um, it has to do with the fact that um, I, I mentioned to you before we did the podcast, I've been doing reading into yeah. world building and stuff for a variety of reasons. And I was reading into soft magic and hard magic systems, not that Wusha is magic, but yeah. the same kind of principle applies, I think. And I, in my opinion, uh, wuxia tends to be soft magic. And, and if you're not familiar with it, basically soft magic, hard magic, uh, soft magic is there's not necessarily a mechanical explanation behind these things. And then with hard magic, there's a lot of more of a mechanical explanation in terms of fantasy. I think probably best example is going to be Lord of the Rings for soft magic and uh, Mistborn for by Sanderson. For hard magic in the Mistborn series, it's a very clear system of magic. Every element does a certain thing, and you know what it does. In in Lord of the Rings, like you don't really know what's going on. Yeah. Gandalf like does this or that, and you don't really know. And I think it's to a large extent it's similar in the Wuxia movies and books. It's like it, there isn't really much of an explanation behind why these characters are so, are so powerful, other than like they know this technique or something. But it's not like there's a, a mechanical system behind it, and so. That makes it a challenge when you're trying to make a game out of something that inherently doesn't really have a lot of rules. And that's not to mention that the rules can change from book to book and movie to movie. And yeah. so anyway, the point of my little little uh, monologue here is just that obviously if you're going to make a wuxia game, you're going to have to 
you, if you're going to make a game, you have to make mechanics for everything. And so yeah. you're going to have to decide what can be done. You know, in, in one movie, a character might be able to, you know, fly from rooftop to rooftop with little to no training. In another movie, that might be a special skill that yeah. they have to learn. And so um, I've had people say, what's the best Wuxia game or whatever? I mean, it depends on what you're aiming for and what yeah. you want. And so in our cool. game, we obviously took inspiration and bits and pieces from here and there and then kind of put them into a cohesive yeah. um a cohesive system that can generally be applied for the most part to most movies and books, but with little caveats here and there. Like you were mentioning earlier about taking out the killing aura aspect yeah. or whatever. You know, if you want to, if you want your game to be really grounded in reality, maybe you want to uh, make lightness arts less uh, fantastic and take out magical arts. Or if you want it to be more, maybe you can uh, empty, yeah, you know, increase the effects that those things have. Yeah, no, that's a big thing. I mean, I did that with um, when I did Ogre Gate. I was kind of my. I mean, I was emulating a lot, but I was always kind of thinking Return of Condor Heroes and Legend of Condor Heroes and all that. But also a lot of the series that I was consuming at the time, the television series, which had a certain level of flashy style to the to the martial arts abilities. Um, but after I finished, I was like, you know, I want to do Come Drink With Me. I want to make a game called Come Kill With Me. And it'll just be like, <laughs> oh, okay, but stripped down to just the Come Drink With Me level of Wuxia. That, that sort of mid to late 60s Shaw Brothers new school Wuxia. And uh, um, that's kind of what we were sort of aiming for here. It was that more that, that grounded style. Um, but I, my point is... You could make 18 wuxia games for 18 different kinds of wuxia movies. Do you know what I mean? And so yeah. that's why it is, uh, um, you know, it's it's ne you're never you're never gonna make the one perfect game. That's why everybody's always making wuxia games. I think, um, you know, same reason for other genres. You're never gonna have one perfect fantasy game. Do you know what I mean that covers all the you know like there's I don't I can't really think of a game that would cover both Lord of the Rings and Mistborn. Do you know what I mean? That's a that's a pretty <laughs> tall order, right? Yeah. Um, so that's, that's why you want more games like this. That's why when I was, um, when I was promoting Ogregate, I was always trying to bring in all the other people that were making Wuxia and celebrate the other Wuxia games. Cause I saw it as an, you know, uh, the more people that are doing this, the more enthusiasm you could be creating for the genre in the, cause there's just not an, it's, it's, it's a genre that, that maybe doesn't get quite enough love in the gaming community. I think that's changing, but it means if you're, you know, like whenever I would sit down and run a Wuxia campaign before I had my own Wuxia games to run, it was always kind of a struggle to find um, the perfect system, but also to find the perfect conversations about Wuxia in RPGs on different forums and stuff, because there just wasn't enough discussion of it. So, yeah, um, I mean, part of it also has to do with the fact that, um, I mean, a lot of the people that are making the games are not necessarily, well, let, let me just rewind, I'll say, I, and put it this way. I think uh, one thing I'm very happy about with Righteous Blood, Ruthless Blades is that it's a collaboration between me and you, not to, like, do ego stroking, but you have watched a massive amount of movies, more than I've watched, and I have access to the language and culture aspect to it. I have an access to the language and culture aspect I think a lot of people don't. And so this particular game, I think, turned out to be quite authentic and accurate in terms of language, culture, and genre. Um, one thing that annoys me is when people who have clearly, who clearly like Wuxia mm -hmm. and have probably seen a few movies here or there, take a few things that they've seen, the movies that they like, and then mm -hmm. try to make it into a game or add it okay. to a game. I have a video um, in which I kind of rant about the Wuxia advice in the Dungeons and Dragons Fifth Edition Game Master Guide. Mm -hmm. It's just really bad. <laughs> like, well, I, I think it. I think that's more a problem in like a bigger game like D and D. Like there's there's smaller Wuxia games that do a really good job. Um, but I think what tends to happen, and I don't mind it so much because I think um, it's sort of like sometimes you take like like D and D is a big tent RPG, right? So if if you're playing D and D, there's a default fantasy assumption. But if you're a GM, maybe you watch you know, the, um, you know, a fistful of dollars or, you know, you want, you watch something like that. And you're like, I want to bring that into my campaign. You don't necessarily want to go and watch every Western movie ever, but you want to bring in, you know, something from that thing. I think it's, I think it's okay. If, if somebody saw, you know, crouching tiger and come drink with me, it was like, I want to bring those into the game. I, I think that that's, 
and the game they're bringing them into is D&D. I think where they went wrong with the thing you showed me is they um they were mixing in like samurai and stuff and it was like this isn't even wuxia. I think that was where that was getting uh yeah, for sure. messy is I I think what must have happened there is is wuxia just became a term for Asian martial arts with vague fantasy elements to them the yeah. uh, and 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 that's what they meant when they used that and i think sure, that's yeah, what that's, that, that's pretty much yeah that's clear from the um from the from when you read it that that's what was happening but you know as the years go by people game, both gamers and readers are getting more mature and sophisticated i, I don't necessarily mean an age i just mean as they consume more content yeah. they're getting more um aware of the genres and whatnot and so things are changing and yeah. i think now i've said this before on this podcast i don't you know i don't think that there's like some right way that you have to do it and that i know that right way mm. and especially when you're dealing with your game group i think as long as you and your game group are happy then that's the most important thing but since we are the designers and we're providing this game i think that providing a an authentic and um you know accurate foundation to build on is important um and so and for instance well this brings i remember a while ago i mentioned there's two things i wanted to talk about this mm -hmm. I'll, I'll save the second thing because it kind of relates to this yeah because we're running out of time so i don't want to okay. cut you off uh. so, okay so anyway the point is just you know i think that players and game masters can do whatever they want with whatever system they want but when you're providing the system and you say this is wuxia then i think that the designer has a responsibility to at least try to have as much accuracy yeah. as possible. Well, I guess that's yeah, and I guess my take on it, I think they have the responsibility to be clear about what it is they're providing. So yeah. if they want to say, we're, we're taking traces of Wuxia, but we're putting, the, you know, then that's, but yeah, you don't want to say this is an authentic Wuxia RPG and then not not deliver that. And also to your point about times changing, I mean, that's, that's uh, the internet has really made people savvy a lot more quickly. Like even when I look back at the Ogre Gate introduction, I'm, I cringe a little bit because of the, like, and you can actually see the language change from the introduction of the book to like midway through the book. And part of the reason for that was, I think at the time, like the standard way to describe like a, a wuxia hero was, uh, uh, was a knight errant. And, yeah. <laughs> and, and that's a really bad and martial hero is probably better or whatever. I think that's the term I eventually adopted, but we had like 18 conversations about this. Well, not you and me, but me and the other people working on the game when I was making our gate. And at the time, I think the consensus was, well, people won't know what we're talking about. If we say, if we don't say knight errant, so we got to say knight errant. Cause that's the state, <laughs> you know what I mean? But then like two, within two years, that was just, that wasn't even the standard anymore. So, um, it's it's one of these things where I think the internet accelerates the uh, uh, what the consensus is for how to describe these things in English, um, and so uh, so so yeah, so it, it's it's definitely something I experienced firsthand, where I was like, whoa, things really advanced quickly when I look back at what I did in 2015, which is <laughs> just five years ago. Um, so. Uh, so yeah, so I, I I guess I guess with that we should probably probably head out. Um, and I know we're gonna be back. Uh, I don't know what movie we're covering next, but we're gonna cover some more movies and talk more about the game. And and again, people can pick up Righteous Blood, Ruthless Blades pre order at Osprey. I think they could probably even get it on Amazon at this point for pre order. Is that have you seen that or is that not? Yeah, it's for pre order on Amazon. Just search Righteous Blood, Ruthless mm -hmm. Blades. It's actually pretty much everywhere that you can order online. It's on mm -hmm. Barnes and Noble. It's on walmart.com okay. for pre-order. All right. Online. So just about everywhere. So you can get it all over the place. And, and yeah, and so until next time, we'll talk to you later. With the laughter comes the rain. With my anger comes a tide of emotion. Killing joy, cutting steel. Dead or insane As you stumble through the night Soothe the anguish and the pain With the soft taste of blood